I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, St. James. And for all those who are tuned in this morning, thanks for joining us. We're, we're glad that you're with us. Um, this is a, a, a reading today, and I'm referring to Mark. Uh, the, the reading today um, uh, is a collation of two stories. Uh, it it's, uh, starts out with uh, Jairus and his, uh, his daughter who is ailing. And in the middle of it, we encounter a woman who is, uh, has a bleeding disorder. And then we have the continuation of, of uh, the, the Jairus story um, and his, his daughter actually uh, dying and Jesus bringing her back to life with that uh, uh, Talitha Kum uh, little, little girl get up, the little child get up. Wonderful, two wonderful stories. And this is on the heels of what we heard Father DJ uh, preach on last week, which is um, Jesus asleep in the boat with his disciples. And the disciples are in the midst of a raging storm and wake him up. Uh, what we don't hear, we skip over, is um, where they were, their destination on, while they were on that ship was uh, Garrison, Garrison, which is uh, an area in the Decropolis, the other side of of the of the Galilean Sea and um, was was a Gentile territory and there where they land uh, there happened to be up above on a hill a, uh, a tomb or a graveyard and there was a man living in the tombs actually in the tombs living in it he was possessed and um, uh, that's where Jesus exercises the garrison demoniac and sends the legion of spirits, uh, evil spirits, into the, the uh, pigs, and the pigs run off into the Sea of Galilee and drown. And so then we're here today. Uh, Jairus is, a, uh, is, a, is a, a, a high official in the temple, a temple priest, and uh, he comes to Jesus as a last resort to heal his daughter. And as they're walking towards Jairus' house, I'm sure people are gathered already because, well, it's Jesus, and Jesus is very well known by this time in his ministry and, and Jairus comes to him and he falls on his knees and really the only reason uh, a Jew falls on his knees is uh, to pray or to worship and uh, he's in an act of worship to Jesus. He knows that he's at his last resort and uh, this Jesus can help his daughter and so he goes to Jesus and, uh, and asks Jesus to please uh, go with him to his house and, and heal his daughter who uh, is his beloved. Um, and on the way, the crowds, I guess, were standing around, decided we don't hear this in the text, but you could speculate that, that uh, they wanted to uh, see what happened at the high priest's house. Jarvis, not the high priest, but the priest at, at, um, uh, at his house. And so they're following Jesus and they're pressing around him. When they say they're pressing in on him, that means that they're really, the streets are narrow and they are, they're really uh, crowded around him. And I can imagine the disciples, like uh, bodyguards, are around Jesus pushing people back and keeping people out and people are reaching out and touching Jesus I'm sure touching his shoulders and touching his arms and touching his clothes and that's where we encounter at this moment the collation story the woman that's been bleeding for 12 years um, and has had um, a real problem with this had, has spent all of her money on doctors all of her money uh, trying to be healed with no luck whatsoever. And her, uh, once again, like Jairus, her last resort is to try to make it to Jesus. And, uh, and she is convinced that if she just touches Jesus, the hem of Jesus' clothing, that she would be healed. And, and as such, she crawls in to this crowd, which would be dangerous at best to crawl in this crowd um, and, and to touch Jesus' clothing and when she does touch his clothing um, she feels the healing from within happen to her and she's healed um, at that moment jesus feeling the power as the scripture says feeling the power drain from him uh, imagine that being so aware that people are touching you and 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 uh, wanting to be close and pressing in on you um, I can imagine like a few weeks ago when Jesus was in the house and the people were pressing in on so much they couldn't eat. He's trying to walk through the streets of Jerusalem and people are pressing in on him once again and touching him and bumping up against him. And yet this woman touches his clothes and he feels the power drain out of him. And he stops. He stops. And he turns to the crowd and he said, who touched me? And 
the crowd and the disciples are going, well, we all touched you. You know, the disciples are bumping into him. The people are reaching out and touching into him. But the woman knows who, she, who he's talking, who Jesus is talking about. And she comes up to him and she says, I touched you. I did it. And then explained her situation. And Jesus' response is just amazing. Uh, daughter, daughter, your faith has healed you. Daughter, your faith has healed you. When I think of this, of this scene, I think of Jesus doing so much more than just simply uh, healing the woman of her blood disorder because uh, really to understand what that means, you have to go to Leviticus. And um, I'm gonna ask Sam if she would put up on our, uh, on our screen this passage. And by the way, if you don't have your Bible, um, uh, go get it, grab it. Uh, you're going to need it. And pretty much any time that I preach, you're going to need that Bible. So go on and just plan on bringing it with you when you go. Um, Leviticus, I'm in chapter 15, and I'm going to read from verse 25 to verse, uh, through verse 27. So um, Leviticus chapter 15, 25 through 27. And this is dealing with bodily discharge. This is about um, a woman's menstrual cycle and about excessive bleeding. Um, and... and uh, uh, please understand that that in Leviticus, this is this is back, uh, you know, two two thousand, uh, almost three thousand years ago, uh, that this was written, and um, it's it's all about understanding what it means to be ritually clean and ritually unclean. And I, I want to say ritually, as in religiously clean and unclean, uh, so so they could be able to enter into the temple in their community. And remember, this this woman's a Jew. And it says, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of her discharge, she shall continue in uncleanliness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Now remember, she has suffered with this for 12 years. She has suffered not only with the, with the bleeding, but with the, with the understanding that she was ritually unclean for 12 years. That means that she couldn't enter the temple, she couldn't offer sacrifices, she couldn't even go in and pray because of this disorder that she had, that she had nothing to do with. She, she, it was nothing that she could, she couldn't have children either. And at that time, children, bearing children was a big part of a woman's identity. Let me continue, I'm on verse 26. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge shall be, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanliness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. Now, this is significant because this woman knows that by going into the crowd, she's going to be touching or touched by people, which makes them ritually unclean. And by reaching out and touching Jesus, Jesus, uh, clothes, she's going to be making Jesus ritually unclean. But for Jesus, that touch is such an important part of his ministry. By this time, he's healed 12 people. 12 people. Well, he's going to heal 12 people. And out of the 12 people, five of them are going to be by a touch. He's going to touch them. He's going to touch five people. Two, just in this, in this, in this pericope that we have for today. He has the, the woman who's bleeding and Jairus' daughter. He's going to touch both and heal both with touch. Touch is a really important part. For us, even today, laying on of hands is an important part of a healing ministry and praying for people. Laying on of hands, anointing, that's touching. That's all touching. It's very important. But realize that this is part and parcel of what it, what it means for Jesus, the, the implications of Jesus having, having a ministry among people who are unclean, ritually unclean, a leper, a blind man, a, a man with a withered hand, all of that causes people to be separated from community. Yet Jesus, in that process of stopping, turning and asking and confronting this woman and saying, daughter, he is reuniting her into community, reuniting her into uh, her community of faith, into her community as a, as a woman, um, into her community as somebody that can be accepted in public. Uh, this is a huge, huge deal for this woman. And she did it without even asking Jesus, just touching 
his clothes, just touching his clothes. Now let's continue on with our story because uh, the story doesn't end there. Jesus continues on to Jairus' house and before he gets there, people come up to him and say, oh Jesus, don't worry about it, it's too late. Uh, the young girl has already passed away. And he said, no, she's just sleeping. And, um, and people laugh and, and kind of mock and scoff at him, the people who had actually seen. And so he only took, he only took a few, he took the young girl's mother and father, Jairus is the father, and um, he took with him uh, three of his disciples. And he went into the room and he says those words, uh, Talitha kum, which is little girl, get up, and he reaches out and he touches her hand and the little girl gets up. Now we realize in our scripture reading that this little girl is 12 years old, so little is not quite uh, the, the, the right statement because she's of childbearing age. She is of marrying age. She's of the age that she would uh, look for matrimony and, and motherhood. And um, so this 12 years old correlates very closely with the 12 years that this woman has been has been bleeding, has been suffering. And like the woman who has been bleeding, um, to touch a dead body makes you unclean, ritually unclean. And so you have to go through steps to be made, to be made clean again. And Jesus, once again, is not worried about his ritual uncleanliness. He knows that that ritual uncleanliness is for, um, is for us mere mortals, so to speak, uh, and, and our safety and benefit. And Jesus is not worried about that because he knows that by, by, by this touch, that he's restoring this, this young girl, not only to, to life and to health, but uh, he's also restoring her to, um, to her family and to her community and, uh, and, and to the world so she can go on and, and live her life, uh, hopefully to the fullest. We don't know about this little girl after, after this encounter, but we hope that she would go on and get married, have children, and raise a family, and have a nice long life. We would hope that that's all that happened to her, just like the woman uh, suffering from bleeding, that she would um, have a chance to go back to her husband or to marry and to have more children or to have children. We don't know uh, where she was in her, in her way, um, but she also uh, could have been uh, just a, a young woman and able to continue on with her community. But could not do that because of the bleeding, could not do it because of the death. And so Jesus restores all of these. And he doesn't just heal, he heals and restores them to community. We see it time after time after time. The gentleman with the, uh, the uh, Gerasim uh, demoniac, um, Gerasim demoniac, we don't, we don't see this passage today, but it's worth going back and reading about it. Uh, Jesus exercises the demons, and where does the town folk find him? F finds Jesus sitting next it, with the with the demoniac clothed sitting next to him and them talking and the he feels the demoniac the person who was who was who was uh, we were calling demoniac because that's what they call him in here the demoniac felt so strongly about what jesus had done that he wanted to become one of his disciples and follow him and jesus says no i need you to go to the decropolis the the 10 cities in that area and tell people what what's happened to you we want it to spread in this area as well as it's spreading over in, in the uh, Jewish area. So Jesus' ministry has expanded way beyond uh, the bounds of, of, of mere Judah or, or uh, Galilee. Now his ministry is, is, uh, is going to be uh, spreading throughout all of the world because, well, the Decropolis are these 10 Roman cities connected right back to Rome. And so that message is going to get all the way back into the Roman Empire. And Jesus knows this. And so he's paving the way, once again, paving the way uh, for us um, uh, by the way, if, uh, if you are interested in, in uh, the passage um, concerning uh, Jesus touching a body and, and it making him unclean, you would need to go to Numbers uh, chapter 19, beginning with verse uh, 11. That's Numbers chapter 19, beginning with verse 11 and going through 13. Whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. He shall uh, cleanse himself with, a, with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, and so be cleaned. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh, on the seventh day, he will not become clean. Whoever touches a dead person, the body of anyone who has died and, and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from Israel because the water of impurity has not been thrown on him. He shall be unclean. The uncleanliness is on him. So this is something that Jesus knows touching this dead person could um, uh, take him out of, not only out of his uh, worshiping community, but out of uh, 
the Jewish uh, practices of going to the temple and actually being there. This is this is this is huge when Jesus uh, is touched by the the woman who's bleeding and who then goes and touches a dead a dead body um, and restores life to her. It's it it's um, it's it separates him and everybody who touches the body from from worshiping uh, in the community. And if it's not ritually um, uh, taken care of, uh, it could separate them completely from from uh, the Jewish worship in the temple, which uh, we can see. Obviously, Jesus uh, uh, does not do that. He goes on because we see in the trial and entry. Of course, he's in the temple. Uh, however. I digress. Uh, what I, the reason I wanted to bring these things to you today is to talk about um, what 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 it means to be reconciled, to be a restored. Um, we we I think we need we forget because well we're two thousand years away from the event, but there's a point when when Jesus is talking to Peter and he says to Peter, um, he says he says Peter uh, I call you the rock and on you I will build my church. <clears throat> now I need to repeat that because I, I think the words have gotten lost somewhere along the line. Um, Peter, on you, I build my church. Jesus is saying that the church belongs to him. He's part of the Trinity, we believe, which means that the church belongs to God. The church, including St. James, belongs to God. And so uh, to be separated from that for any reason, uh, needs, we need restoration. And so when we, when we think about being restored back to community, uh, that happens through the church. We're restored uh, to the community, the worshiping community, but to the large community through the church. And when we're coming off the heels of a pandemic, and I know uh, some people that are watching this are watching it because they just don't feel comfortable coming into a space. Maybe they're not vaccinated yet. Maybe they choose not to get vaccinated. Or maybe they've, uh, they're just um, living with a, with a fear of contracting uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 uh, virus, all valid, all completely and totally understandable, but there's going to point, come a point in time when restoration is needed. Some have, have chosen to be uh, restored and back in, in the midst of, of the body of the community, but there's others who are suffering uh, because they're not restored. And uh, we need to know, we need to know that restoration comes through, through, um, through the church. It's not the only way that we can be restored, but it's 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 a it's a very visible and tangible way of restoration into the community. And as we come back together uh, in this in this form of restoration, I pray that we we have a full understanding that that the church belongs to God, and as as it does belong to the church of God, that that is that it belongs to God, that we're restored through God's love, grace, mercy. Um, forgiveness, reconciliation, so forth and so on, so forth and so on. So this, this understanding of our, of our scripture day is, is relevant to us coming out from under a pandemic and our need to be uh, reconciled, reconciled and restored back to our community, our community being our worshiping community, and even further than that, our community uh, in the Lake Highlands area and Dallas uh, or wherever you're viewing this. Uh, we need that restoration. That restoration comes through Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ can be found um, most fully in the body of the, of the, of the church or in the body of the congregation. Um, I want to remind us once again, you've heard me say this before, this is a beautiful edifice and we use it quite well. You've seen parts of it uh, throughout. You see it behind me. There's a lot more of it in front of me and uh, behind the camera. Um, but it's a beautiful place to worship, but it's just a building. The church are the people, and so the community is the people, and that's what we need to be restored back to. And I hope that, uh, that I make a little sense in this when I say uh, we are the representatives or the emissaries of, of God on earth when we take on our baptismal vows. Um, we, we become emissaries of, of God on earth. That's the reason this Matthew 28 passage of going out and making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is so important uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a continual light uh, held in front of us as, as, as our direction of where we're headed. And so uh, to be reconciled and restored back to that community means so much uh, to so many. Not just, not just me being restored back into the community, but other people's restoration 
uh, brings them in contact with, with me as well. And I hope that as you uh, feel more comfortable with where you are uh, in your vaccination process or, or where you are uh, within the pandemic, that you'll feel comfortable coming back into uh, the community and allowing the community uh, to show you love, grace, mercy, and, um, and to give you support through prayers and, um, and, and uh, all of the other benefits that go along with that. So you too would be restored like the woman who was bleeding, like Joris' daughter, like the, the uh, uh, garrison demoniac. You would be restored back to uh, the community of, of faith and community of believers and then also to the wider community um, outside. Uh, and all of this we, is found through, through uh, Jesus Christ. Um, I hope and pray that you know the Christ that I'm talking about. I hope and pray that if you don't know the Christ that I'm talking about, that you'll reach out uh, to me, to Deacon Phil, uh, to, to, to uh, a trusted uh, family member who you know knows Christ or to uh, a pastor in your area that knows Christ uh, so you too can, uh, can understand the loving, restorative, reconciling love of Jesus Christ and then have grace and mercy. Uh, flow over you. Um, if you're looking for a church home, I want to invite you to St. James. Uh, we're a loving community. We love Jesus. Uh, we love the scripture, the Old and the New Testament, um, and and uh, we would like to, to extend that love and, uh, and acceptance to you as well. Um, if you're not in our area, please find a, uh, a whole Bible church and, and, and be involved in that church. Uh, it's so important to your continued uh, uh, faith journey and your religious health. Um, understanding that God gave us the church, it's not perfect by any means, but it is uh, what we have uh, on earth to, to study and to be in fellowship with one another. And that's the, the whole reason for church is to, to worship, to fellowship, and to, uh, to continue to study God's word and grow in our faith. Um, and it should nurture you. Uh, so find a community that you feel nurtured in and loved in and, uh, and, and know that, that Christ wants to restore you and, and uh, back to community and then to reconcile you back to himself. And all this I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.